Hello world. Um, welcome to Happenstance, a ephemeral, nomadic, and spontaneous reading series curated by Kason Sharp. Over the next few months, each event that will take place will happen in a different, new, and unique location around the city. One reading will be delivered by a local artist, poet, um, or writer. Only a few hours before each event, we'll make the name of the reader and the location public. So if you happen to be nearby, please come and watch in person. The first event is set here on, on this giant rock, this massive boulder called, York, called the Yorkville Rock. It's said to be 650 tons and hundreds of millions of years old. It was found in northern Ontario and is said to likely be part of the Canadian shield that has long since eroded. It's also a place where people have lunch, catch up with their friends, and it's even been known as a it's been known as breakup rock because it's a popular place for couples to come and go through a breakup. So this place is heavy, uh, both literally as well as through this accumulation of past lovers and and their their unlit flames. Um, so I'd like to introduce the first reader of the series as well as the curator. His writings have been published widely uh, in Canada and online. A collection of his stories uh, were published by Metatron Press in 2017 and he's my friend, Kason Sharp. Thank you, Parker, uh, for introducing me, and thanks for having me. Um, I chose the Yorkville Rock because um, I used to spend a lot of time here in high school. Um, I would come and loiter for hours and try to spot celebrities during TIFF. Um, it was a really meaningful spot to me, so I'm happy to be here reading. Um, and I'm going to read a story uh, that takes place uh, when I was in high school. Um, this is called To Know It When You See It. I was at a house party in High Park in a circle of girls on the lawn with a Mickey of vodka when the public fact of my gayness tipped some critical mass. I was 16. It was spring, verging on summer. I had a crush that spring, the same one I'd had all year. He was a grade ahead of me, but we were in the same drama class, a grade 11-12 split. He was quiet, so quiet that it was his thing. The class was called Drama Production, or Drama Pro. We staged the school play. That year, we put on Timberlake Wittenberger's The Ash Girl, a reimagined Cinderella story in which the eponymous heroine escapes a torturous family and battles manifestations of the seven deadly sins in order to t attend the ball of the royal family who have been inexplicably recast as South Asian. I was cast as the prince's best friend and was happy to get a big part, even though I was convinced I only got it because the character was brown and there was only a handful of brown kids to choose from. The kid who played the prince was from Iran. I told the director I was black, but it didn't seem to matter. The director dressed us in what we assumed was traditional Indian garb, sourced from the school's costume room in the basement. They hired a local South Asian choreographer to teach us Bollywood dance, to teach us a Bollywood dance for the rehearsal. They told me to ham up my performance, to play it for laughs, and that's what I did. My crush was white and played the sin of sloth. I talked to him all night at the cast party, which was hosted by one of our classmates in the basement of a middle-class home in Riverdale. My crush was gay but didn't really like dicks. They were sort of ugly in real life, he said. I laughed. 
He was moving to Nova Scotia for university in the fall. I had never touched a dick that wasn't mine before, had never had one unveiled to me as an event. I got my first fake ID that spring from a basement head shop on Young Street that sold the usual bric-a-brac of teenage stoners, bongs and glass pipes, Led Zeppelin t-shirts, Bob Marley posters. They advertised their fake IDs as souvenirs. Leslie took me there one day after work. She had bought her fake ID from there a year before but had since lost it. The squat older man who ran the place took our pictures passport style in front of a white backdrop. He disappeared into a back room, re-emerged 10 minutes later with a health card and a student card for each of us. They said they could stand under a black light, he told us, which made them more authentic. I got my first job that spring too, working weekends at the warehouse of a wild foods company owned by my brother-in-law's dad. My job was to keep an eye on the place while the rest of the team worked different farmers markets across the city. My tasks were minimal, keep the place clean, package, label, and shelve any incoming product, answer the phone. They could have managed just fine without me, but my brother-in-law's dad threw me a bone because he knew I could use the extra cash. When everybody had left for the markets, I played my music loud and danced around the warehouse like it was my very own nightclub. Years later, rising rents squeezed out many of Geary's commercial occupants, including my brother-in-law's dad. This max exodus created a vacuum for a clandestine nightlife scene to develop around these newly unoccupied warehouses, as if predicted by my teenage daydreams. I wore whatever I wanted to work, mostly a pair of blue seersucker shorts or this pair of black skinny jeans I bought on sale from, Kensington, from Exile in Kensington. I forgot what the brand was, but the logo appeared on the inside hemline, a black and white drawing of a cigarette. They clung to me, made me feel leggy like a model, like the paparazzi shots I'd seen of Agnes Dean during Paris smoking during Paris Fashion Week. Over time, the dreams developed rips in the knees, thigh, and crotch. I tried to sew the rips shut or hold them closed with safety pins, but they would inevitably burst open, spreading further each time until the jeans finally self-annihilated. Dad said I shouldn't wear such tight pants. People might get the wrong impression. Dad and I lived in the same one-bedroom apartment in Alexandra Park where we'd lived since I was in preschool. Dad slept in the living room on a futon that he'd stretch out at night and fold back into a couch shape come morning. We spent most of our time in the living room a few feet apart with our backs turned, him facing the TV in one direction and me facing the computer in another. He came home to find me masturbating in front of the computer on several occasions. I heard his key in the lock and fumbled to pull up my underwear and close the tab of whatever porn site I had going. When he opened the door, I'd sit there embarrassed but trying to keep my cool. We never acknowledged it. Anyway, what could be done? He attempted to broach the conversation a few times. The things I looked at on the computer, the porn, the tight pants, but every time he lost his nerve. Dad was a hobby photographer. He bought himself a fancy Nikon with an adjustable lens that nobody else was allowed to touch. When I was a preteen, we used to walk down to Nathan Phillips Square on warm summer nights to see the jazz festival or buy thick cut fries from the food trucks parked on the corner. He used to take my picture there in front of City Hall, posted in the shallow concrete dugout that doubled as a skating rink in the winter. But that spring, he didn't take my picture at all. I didn't want to be a subject anymore, so we found new subjects. The plants he grew on the balcony, his friends on Sunday nights at jam sessions, the empty buildings he passed while walking the streets alone. The previous year, grade 10, I took a photography class with Mr. Meadows. The whole school was in love with Mr. Meadows. And, a rumor had it, and rumor had it he gave his number to his favorite graduating students at the end of the year. Once I realized his favorites were always girls, I lost interest in his class. I never got the hang of photography. My film was always overexposed, my focus blurred, or else the picture was ruined by the smudge of my thumb. Most of all, I hated the dark room. I hated the chemical smell, the sinister red light. I hated dipping the paper into the developer and waiting for an image to appear. My photos never turned out how I wanted them to. I went to Pride that spring, the first time I remember going. I went to the parade with the same circle of girls from the High Park house party. We snuck beers in our bag, but not enough water. I felt like a spectator. There were so many young people on Young Street, I couldn't even see the floats. We, lock, we walked along Church Street. Men lined the block to, go to get into bars. Some of them cruised me as I passed, but I didn't have a word for that yet. I wanted to line up for bars too, but nobody knew if bouncers were strict about fake IDs in the village. 
I had a feeling the real pride lurked just below this one, an underground I couldn't see. I saw other boys my age. We made eye contact as we passed each other on the street, curious in our try-hard outfits, clinging to our girlfriends, a different kind of cruising. We wanted to be noticed by each other, but we wouldn't be caught dead noticing. They wanted it too, the real pride. We didn't know what we were looking for, but we would know it when we saw it. I took a handful of condoms from a drag queen on the street and stuffed them into my pocket nonchalantly, as if to be like, whatever, I do this all the time. We walked back to the subway by late afternoon, sunstroke, tired, a beer each buzzed. How anticlimactic. I went to Pride and all I got were a few free condoms and a pair of cheap sunglasses from TD Bank. We made plans to meet up later at Paula's to pre-drink. We would use our fake IDs to get into a Pride party at Wrong Bar, where there would be multiple DJs and last call was extended to 3 a.m. That night I wore a pair of skinny, dark Levi's with black brogues, a lapis buttoned down unbuttoned to my sternum, and a children's XL blazer and navy. The look I was going for was 80s LA, which became refracted through my own limited understanding of a decade I didn't live through, my references being Brett Easton Ellis's Less Than Zero, and, and to cap it off, I threw on a pair of rainbow sus suspenders because it was pride, get it? I was still too nervous to use my fake ID at the LCBO, so I bought a tetra back of Sawmill Creek Sauvignon Blanc from the wine rack that didn't card. Paula was my richest friend. Her family lived in Yorkville, in a condo on the 30th floor of the Manulife Center. I gave the concierge my name in the lobby and looked down at my secondhand shoes on the white marble floor. Paula looked surprised when she opened the door of her apartment. She was in sweatpants. Everyone bailed, she said. I didn't have this, a cell phone at the time, didn't get the memo. I have wine, she said, holding up, I said, holding up the Tetra Pak. Paula could have told me to go home, but she didn't. I helped her pick out an outfit, a jean jacket over a white camisole with a pair of snakeskin pants. We blasted music in her room, drank wine, had her little sister take pictures of us. We went downstairs to buy cigarettes, smoking them on the curb as we looked up at the imposing tower of the Manulife Center spiraling into the sky. We made the cab drop us off a block early so we could walk up to Rong Bar. Paula said it was important to make a proper entrance. Inside, the club was dark and loud, with fewer people than I had anticipated. We'd gone early because the earlier you showed up, the less chance your ID would get rejected. Even if the bouncer knew it was a fake, they'd give you a pass just to have more bodies in the space. Once inside, we stashed our bags in a corner and ordered a round of Jager bombs. We saw Martin, an older boy who'd gone to our high school. Isn't it past your bedtime, he teased. Martin was capital G gay and a legend in drama pro for his performance as Lysander in A Midsummer Night's Dream. As soon as he'd graduated, he'd left town to get his BFA at some prestigious acting school. I'm just back for the summer, he said. We danced in a cluster, the three of us and some of Martin's friends who were visiting the city. Men took off their shirts as the night progressed. I had acne all over my back. I hated my arms. Martin was skinny like I was, but taller. Light stubble around the jawline. His skin was so pale it glowed in the dark. He sipped his vodka soda and shifted from foot to foot like he was waiting for a better song to play. I wanted to take him aside, business-like, and ask him to kiss me, but his eyes were elsewhere. Into the void of the dance floor, the smoke machine, a hairy chest under a strobe light. He was looking at men and men were looking at him, but who was looking at me? Half the purpose of any party was to have your picture taken. This was as true for pride parties at Rongbar as it was for the drama pro cast parties in Riverdale. After every party, you could expect a Facebook album that documented it. I spent entire afternoons at the Wild Foods warehouse combing over that documentation. It was during one of those never-ending afternoons at work that I finally worked up the nerve to ask out my crush over Facebook. He let me down gently. I felt a humiliation so private there was nowhere for it to go. I wished he had said something hurtful so I could hate him. I clicked through his profile pictures. Unflattering, poor quality, cropped too close, caught at a weird angle. Why didn't he have a sense of what looked good and what didn't? I felt cheated, but that came with its own vindication. He was only remarkable because I had decided that he was remarkable. I never spoke to him again. I changed my profile picture to a photo of Paula and me that her little sister had taken on a disposable camera before the pride party. In the picture, we're standing against a white wall in the foyer of her apartment. I'm wearing a pair of Ray-Bans, one hip cocked, Paula leaning her elbow on my shoulder, her long blonde hair pushed over to the side. The photo got six likes and seven comments, which felt like a lot at the time. 
Dad came to see the second performance of the Ash Girls three-day run, even though I begged him not to. Before the show, the director pulled me aside. She said my energy was low. Was everything okay? I'd had a rush of endorphins after opening night, which had, left, which had quickly subsided and left me deflated. I felt self-conscious about my performance. I didn't want to do it again. The director handed me a bottle of antiperspirant. My role was very physical, two dance routines and a fight scene. Apparently one of my co-stars had complained about my smell. Turns out I was a, as much of an actor as I was a photographer. Didn't like the dark room, didn't like the stage. I don't remember my performance that evening at all. I imagine I delivered my lines as rehearsed, but I know my mind was elsewhere. The circle of girls on the lawn in High Park let out a cheer when I sheepishly confessed what everyone had long suspected, the echo of which stayed with me that spring. I was a piece of photo paper awash in chemicals. I was an image beginning to appear. I came out of the auditorium after curtain call, my face still streaked with pancake makeup. Dad stood awkwardly by himself in the lobby, holding a single rose. Thank you.